every story starts with a blank page. This one has the title Daylight Fleets at the top and by J. Wilburn. I'm gonna lowercase the B and by. Let's see what we can make of this particular story. I've kind of made this a little bigger than I intended to in, in my notes, so I don't know how uh, short the short story is going to be, but we'll find out. All right. The dark fleet of boats. No, it'll be ships. Dark fleet of ships drew toward the shore above the deserted harbor by several miles. The coastline village of True Haven Home Harbor. We'll call it True Haven Harbor. True Haven Harbor looked as deserted as the previous villages this terrible armada had visited in recent days All right, let's do a new line most of the villages along the coast and throughout the islands were stripped bare of life after each invasion. Now villagers who heard and believed believed the legends of the terrible fleet were fleeing ahead of its arrival. Still, the human crewmen loaded up their tenders and made for sure to investigate. The land ahead stood deathly still. The ships behind rocked and creaked on their anchor chains, I'll say at the end, at the end of their anchor chains, the hulls appeared so black even in the sunlight so that they could have been built from night itself as opposed to wood. All right. The ragtag crew speared onto the lonely sands and climbed out together as they crossed the dunes and then the grass between them and the structures. Um, Abram Cocker known by friends and enemies 
as old RAM led out in the middle of the shore party. He had been the pirate captain of the Cry Havoc. He still sailed that ship and ordered the crew, let's say the surviving crew, the surviving crew during the day, but he held no illusions that he was still captain. To his right, a former officer, to his right, a former officer of the of the good answer kept pace with him kept pace with old ram to his left a cabin boy from a ship ram couldn't recall, looked about nervous, libertine, asked, isn't this your former village, cricket? boy cleared his throat a couple times before answering in another life yes sir old ram didn't know the boy's name beyond the moniker beyond the moniker of cricket they passed between the buildings doors and windows stood open as if to show there was no one left inside. They passed abandoned carts, a smattering of scattered goods, and other rubbish spilled and not cleaned by whoever left here in a hurry. Libertine sighed and said, if we don't start finding people soon, The dead men will begin to feed upon us. Old Ram answered with a grunt and then added, We better hunt up a few living souls then. I suspect 
these wily uh, villagers are not wandering far, we might be able to hunt them out of the woods, or we can act as if we are sailing north and stop short, letting them return on their own. Do you think Lear will be patient with that plan? Captain Cocker. Libertine did not look at Ram as he asked the question. He seemed to be looking for villagers under a broken bench. As I gather, Lear does not speak any languages men use today. Now, Libertine did consider the pirate captain before he said the others are happy to translate our failures to him. I that they are. Okay, I want to add something up here when they mention this character named Lear. Um, Cricket let out a little whine like a dog. Ram might have swatted the boy for it on any other day, but he himself was feeling feeling the part of a beaten dog this sunny day. All right, let's roll this story along. Cricket, Cricket let out another high noise from the back of his throat. Old Ram considered that swat again, but then the boy pointed and spoke. There, see him? They looked ahead, and both the captain and the, f let's say both the pirate, both the pirate and the former officer must have seen 
the figure at the same second. For they went from normal pace and squinting to wide eyes and stuttered steps. Okay, need to add that there's other men behind them. Um, ragtag crew spread to the to his right to libertine the boy. Um, let me add one more here. The mixed company of former men of honor and former men of simple thievery continued on together behind uh, Ram, Libertine, and Cricket. There we go. All right, so let's see what these pirates have found, shall we? Okay. All right, there we are. In a chair that had been dragged out. Let me spell chair right. It'll impress my friends if I can spell chair. In the chair that had been dragged out from one of the buildings to the center of the square. In a chair that had been dragged out from one of the buildings to the center of the, s of the square in front of the well. A, an old man crouched in the seat with his arms folded and his head bowed. He was the only other person. So he was the only person of True Haven Harbor anywhere to be seen. As the party drew closer, Old Ram went from thinking the fellow the fellow was dead to sleeping to sitting and watching them come to him ram settled on the conclusion that this man was mad. Perhaps they left the village idiot as a sacrifice to the fleet of the dead as the rest of the village took to the trees and the hills. <clears throat> uh, old Ram let the sole of his boot scrape. Okay, let me spell that right. Everyone will be so impressed if I can spell boot. Uh, the old the old, old ram let the sole of his boot scrape on the gritty cobbles just shy of the old man's bare feet. The 
the okay let's do a new paragraph the old fellow lifted his wrinkled face and pale eyes on Ram and the rest. He was so sallow and colorless, let's say I'm lifeless, that he could have fit in just fine with Lear's with Lear's people. Okay. Introduce yourself, sir. Ram said. The fellow swallowed but did not speak. He didn't look away. He didn't make a move. <clears throat> Old Ram turned to Cricket and asked, do you recognize this fellow from the days of your old life? He looks ancient enough to have been sitting in this chair since before the village was made. Cricket nodded and said he is called Glamour. What sort of name is that? Libertine asked. Um, Cricket said he's an oracle. All right, let me spell that right. He's an oracle. He can tell the future. Ram practically hooted at that fun fact. Is that so? Tell me the future, then, my good glamour, sir. The old man said, death, it comes. It, come, it comes. Ram snorted and other crewmen laughed behind him. I imagine many could have guessed that. Do you have more, sir? It comes soon, but not quick.
Sounds like a riddle. Sounds like a riddle. One of the men said from behind the captain. Not a very difficult one, Ram said. Do you know how death will come? I believe I can tell you if you aren't sure. Not a very difficult one, Ram said. Do you know how death will come? I believe I can tell you if you aren't sure. Glamour. Oh, let me spell that right. Glamour blinked slowly and said, Not, not a very difficult one, Ram said. Do you know how death will come? I believe I can tell you if you aren't sure. Glamour blinked slowly and said, let's say and asked, for me or for you? Ram narrowed his eyes. I imagine I'd outlive you even if this weren't the last day for True Haven Harbor. You see only to the end of your nose. Glamour said. And that will be your undoing. Enlighten me, then, Oracle. Tell me my fate, since I already know yours. Bait, the old man said. Old Ram shook his head and said, What's that? The cries rose up behind him, but by the time he started to turn, The unseen attackers had him on the ground with the others. His bad day had only just begun. All right, let's do scene break. As night fell, True Haven Harbor grew quiet once more and appeared as deserted. 
as deserted as it had when the landing party came ashore. Moans, soft moans and cries. Lifted, muffled into the dying light. Insects and other night creatures joined that ominous chorus. The dark ships continued their percussion of softly tilting this way, this way and that upon the waves. Okay, let's fix this word. Uh, percussion, that's what I'm trying to write. All right. The dark ships continued their percussion of softly tilting this way and that upon the waves. Not too many ships to count, but they hurt the eyes to look upon too closely as night fell. Alright, hit an extra letter again. Alright, let's bring this up a little so it's centered to my eye. But they hurt the eyes to look at, to, to look upon too closely for too long as night fell. Alright. The dark paint covered the former names of these of these vessels. I was going to get another adjective in there, but I don't think I need it. Among them were the faded letters of fine honorable honorable names such as the good answer quick hawk highest tide trinity hope Violet skies. The dandy. And many more. More than... many more, I don't want to use more twice here. Um, many... Say... A dozen... Ragged, say a dozen different, ragged, a dozen different flags for as many nations flapped, torn, ragged, and forgotten upon black masts. More than a few trading companies and admirals wondered about the fate of these vanished ships.
others along this coast knew all too well what had happened. Among the honorable names, capable ships with feared names sat anchored as well. The Cry Havoc, Savage Jewel, Terror, let me change that, Terror's Cup, Bloody Rambler, and more. that ready for a different sort of raid upon this quiet evening shore. All right. The night crew awoke. As the last, let's say some, some of the night crew woke as the last of the purple light faded from the horizon. They crawled out upon the many decks and looked across the water at the lightless shore. No signal torches greeted them. They turned about, scanning their own ships for the lowly day crew. Not a warm soul showed itself. Lear kept his eyes locked upon shore. Okay, Lear kept his eyes locked upon shore. He saw the tenders still beached in the sand. He saw the tender still beached in the sand. No crew showed themselves there either. As his eyes adjusted, he saw further and spied living men lifted above the ground. Lear did, let's say, the ancient creature did look away and barked an order to his lessers in a language 
from a long dead nation. He knew a few words in modern tongues by accident. But he saw no need. But he saw no need. <clears throat> he knew a few words in modern tongues, but by accident, but he saw no need to learn the languages of men who would be here today and gone tomorrow along with their whole temporary civilizations. Let's not say whole, let's just say with their temporary civilizations. Several other creatures turned to move below deck. Several other creatures turned to move below deck to carry out his order. They all were, um, let's say, who did he talk to? He only knew a few words. They were all his lessers. A maddening scent reached his nose and his eyes glowed bright. Fresh blood. Veins and arteries. Veins and arteries had been opened just now by living men upon the shore. The day crew had come through finally. Whatever battle they had to fight in order to bring this feast, it had apparently continued into nightfall. The others took to the air and flew the others took to the air and flew out across the water. Lear growled. He was to feed first, but the smell of fresh spilled blood in these quantities were too much for his kind. He soared out himself not to be left behind. The lesser creatures who had gone below deck now flew behind him as well, crying out at his back. Lear landed 
to find several men lifted up upon crosses. There, let's say they, they moaned and groaned through gags over their mouths. As they bled, all right, let's start a new paragraph here. As they bled down the poles of their crosses, the others climbed up and sunk their fangs into the exposed necks and lapped up the blood already leaking from their fresh wounds. not to be left behind. Lear floated up and looked into the terrified face of a dirty bearded man. He, okay, let's say, Lear unhinged his jaw and exposed fangs like sabers. Then, through his bloodlust, He recognized the face. Lear ripped away the gag over Captain Abram old ram cocker's mouth the black claws at the end of his pale fingers I'm gonna need to describe this vampire a little bit more when we go back for the edit but uh, I'm, I'm not gonna worry about that right now the black claws at the end of his pale fingers um, raked bloody furrows down Ram's cheek. The former captain of the Cry Havoc who once begged for his life and agreed to serve Lear and his immortal kind for the rest of his days. Now stammered out, it's a trap. This is all a trap. Lear understood none of it. The other vampires landed at the 
the foot of old ram's cross. Okay, the other vampires landed at the foot of old ram's cross. They spoke over one another. And in their panic, they still, and in their panic, they spoke in languages Lear would not understand, even if they went one at a time. He stared down at them and then over their heads to the abandoned ships on the water. Only half of the complement a vampire crew had come ashore. Where were the rest? He shot he shouted out. Let's say his voice boomed with the question. in his ancient tongue. The vampires on the ground. All right, hold on. The vampire, the vampires on the ground switched to words Lear could comprehend. They still spoke over one another. Dead, staked, murdered. Someone, while we slept, while we slept, trap <clears throat> silver jaws now let's start with metal metal jaws say metal teeth metal teeth locked down on both of Lear's wrists and he growled out in animal rage and pain as he thrashed to free himself As he thrashed to free himself, he felt weaker. He felt weaker and weaker until he dangled in the air from the jaws of the trap. He started to cry out, but then looked up in shock as smoke boiled out of his wounds. 
silver. The teeth. And the trap itself were made of silver. How did such a thing exist? How had this unremarkable village found... How did this unremarkable village find enough silver and the skill to craft this abomination? He started to cry out again. But then saw the others hanging by arms or legs or shoulders from silver traps just like his. Free me. He could barely whisper the words now. The small group of free vampires on the ground stepped forward to free the oldest among them. The twang of taut leather sent thick wooden shafts into the chests of the free vampires. They staggered as the wood in their hearts and chests I'll say lungs, hearts and lungs robbed them of strength Lear watched as their eyes dimmed he guessed his eyes were dimming as well and it filled him with a dark rage. He no longer had the strength to express properly. Humans, lowly villagers, stepped into view. The vampires with the vampires with the thick arrows staked into them reached out with black claws to fight back with the last of their strength. But the common villagers pushed the weakened vampires to the ground 
under Lear's feet. The ancient vampire struggled against the silver trap locked over and biting into his forearms. He managed to twist in place but came nowhere near freeing himself. He tried to kick one of the closest villagers, a boy, but he could not summon the strength to lift his hanging leg that high. Then he swore he recognized the boy. All humans looked alike, looked mostly alike to him though, and his vision was starting to blur. The devious, ambushing humans did not cut off the heads of the wounded vampires on the ground. Instead, they hammered metal stakes into the earth and then snapped silver traps over the ankles of the last few fallen immortals. Lear growled out threats and promises to the horrid warm-blooded Alright, let me fix a spelling here real quick. I think it's two R's. Yes, it is to the horrid, warm-blooded pests that circled around him as if he were nothing to be feared. His voice broke three times, but he continued to rant. They can't understand you, the boy Lear had, had tried to kick, said to him. Lear actually understood the words. They can't understand you, the boy Lear had tried to kick, said to him. Lear actually understood the words. He fell silent and fought the urge to close his eyes. And drift away. I need to fix that sentence. There's two hands in it. 
he fell silent and then we'll put a comma and say fighting the urge to close his eyes and drift away it wasn't Lear's native tongue from eons ago but it was an old language he did know now let's do comma he recognized the boy it was one of the cabin boys from one of the many crews Lear and his fellows had attacked on the high seas at night most of the men from each of those attacks was fed upon until dry, torn to pieces, and tossed on the water to feed the things living in the darkness below. What's next? A rare few over the centuries were turned that was very rare and had not that was very rare and only to replace others who fell. In unlucky accidents. A few more humans were spared in exchange for becoming the day crew to guard while Lear slept to prepare the next meal and to stake out new territories for feeding grounds. Lear had grown weary of hiding and staying landlocked. He had decided with other like-minded vampires that humans were to be enjoyed even if their numbers dwindled as a result. The night and the earth, the night, the earth, and the seas should belong to the immortals. The air blinked away the blurriness 
in his vision, but it only subsided a little. This boy had turned on him, and now he hung vulnerable from such a simple snare. He growled out at the traitor child. The boy that the day crew called Cricket waved Lear off like he were an annoyance instead of the oldest and most powerful being in all the world. Cricket said, I only understand a little. You speak too fast. I don't care what you say. growled out at the traitor child in the less ancient tongue the boy had used. I don't care what you have to say either. This was my village and you won't have it. All right. Lear peeled back his lips. Lear peeled back his lips and showed his fangs, which were already retreating into the ducks, hidden in the roof of his mouth. He wanted to tear the boy open. He wanted to scream out more threats, but he had not the energy, so this old monster slumped under his trap. The other humans moved about, stabbing spears into the bodies of the day crew. They had hung on crosses okay. that they had hung upon crosses the other humans moved about stabbing spears into the bodies of the day crew they had they had hung upon they had hung upon crosses as bait As the muffled 
screams died away. The humans. The human villagers used other tools to remove the heads of the bitten crewmen. They would not have a chance to turn. Old Old, uh, old Ram, I forgot what I called that pirate. Old Ram, whose gag had been removed, screamed the loudest. He begged and cried for his life more than the day Lear had offered him grace to become part of his day crew. He did not understand Ram's words, but he knew their intent. Lear had not had a chance to bite Ram, but the old pirates head tumbled to the ground anyway. At least his begging was over. Lear waited for his <clears throat> end to come. But the humans kept their distance and <clears throat> but the humans kept their distance and left the vampires languishing in the silver traps a few younger men used the tenders to sail out to the ships. They brought back some treasure, but not much. As Lear watched, We're in the home stretch here. As Lear watched the great ships lilted, yeah, lilted to one side or the other. And one by one they sunk below the water. As his fleet as his fleet as his fleet diminished Lear thought about the vampires who had been staked and killed 
in their sleep. If these crafty villagers had time to do that, why not end them all instead of waiting for them to wake up and come ashore? He called, okay, let's say Lear. Lear called out to the humans who wouldn't even look at him. He cried out to the vampires suspended around him for them to translate. Most wouldn't open their eyes and even the ones who did would not look at him either. When the sun started to rise in the east out over the water through the masts still sticking up from the watery grave of the fleet Lear started to suspect why they had brought him ashore. The sky took on colors that did not look real to him. He did not remember what sunrise looked like. Even before that fiery orb of death, even before that, let's say top rim, top rim, of that fiery orb of death broke the horizon. His skin started to smoke and burn in places not touching the silver. Other vampires cried out and begged for mercy like common worthless humans. The sun rose and rose until it shined bright and terrible in his face. Lear tried to twist away, but had no strength. The world became A became an inferno of endless pain. Even he started to scream for death in the language 
of his long ago youth. Okay, his skin blackened. And peeled away in chunks. Just to expose more raw spots that burned and smoked anew. Even, I didn't realize I was going to be describing vampire death so much, but I guess that's what this story is about. Even as bone showed through. Even as bone showed through, um, ruined flesh and charred muscle, the bones smoked, burned, and hurt too. Soon his bones were as black, were as black as the ships he used to command without fear. Lear was not sure when he lost consciousness but he awoke to renewed pain he did not have a single nerve left in his body. But as he awoke to the sun falling in the west, he hurt again. As night approached, He also felt new energy building inside him. If he could free himself, he would show these little short-lived creatures that he could still make them suffer even after he had burned in the sun all day As he turned his blurry eyes from side to side, he saw the humans now removing the heads of the blackened vampires. They had trapped all day. They came to Lear last. And faced him. The vampire tried to move 
and tried to speak. But he had no working muscles left anywhere in his body. It was that cabin boy, Cricket, who swung the blade. and removed Lear's head, killing, making that little boy. It was the cabin boy Cricket who swung the blade and removed Lear's head, making that little boy one of the greatest vampire Slayers of all time. No one had ever killed one as old as Lear, and probably never would again. All right, let's do one more short scene here. Um, Cricket, who the other boys of True Haven Harbor, who the other boys of True Haven Harbor knew as Trig, dropped the blade and fell to his knees crying. It was over. The long nightmare of serving these blood sucking monsters was finally over. Every last one of them was gone. The ships they had stolen and repurposed as floating tombs were sunk too. The villagers of his true home had succeeded where countless others had failed. His friends, Sim, Alcott, and Dell lifted him, lifted Trig to his feet and guided him toward the water. Trig went on crying without knowing where they were going or why. As they reached the water's edge in the last light of the late afternoon, Trig wiped his eyes and tried to step back. Now let's say tried to turn. Tried to turn to look upon his friends. But they held 
him tight. His breath caught and he looked from side to side. What's going on? We won. It's over. It's almost over. Sim said. Uh, Alcott on his other side added. All right, let me pull this down a little. Alcott on his other side added, just hold still and don't fight. What do you mean? Trig demanded. I fought with you. I sent warning that they were coming. I'm one of you. What are you doing? You were one of them, Sim said. Trig started to struggle. but couldn't free himself. More hands fell on him. Alcott said, don't fight, you'll make it worse. Make what worse. I helped you. I saved you all. Tell me what you're doing. Tell me what you're doing. Um, Dell kicked the back of Trigg's of Trigg's leg and dropped him to his knees in the sand in the wet sand everyone who helped those monsters even a little must pay for everyone who died at their unholy claws and fangs. I was a victim too, Trigg said. They held me against my will. I was a slave, not a crewman. Let me go. You're only alive because I warned you and told you what you must do to kill them. I helped you. You owe me. Let me go. As his friends held on, 
Trig twisted his head to yell for the adults and the village elders to help him. What he saw was the whole village standing grim faced behind him. What he saw was the whole village standing grim faced behind him. He did not see his family. Let's make this a new paragraph here. He did not see his family. He only had a cousin. He only had an uncle. A few cousins. And one great aunt still living. It was why he went to see in the first place. He cried out for them to save him, but he heard no answer from them or anyone else. His friends and a few others dragged him out, dragged him out beyond waist deep in the ocean. He struggled say Trig. Trig, who was called Cricket upon the waters, struggled, cried, and begged as hands took hold as hands fisted no that's not right as hands um, took hold of his hair and bent his face toward the water he repeated over and over they made me. They made me. They made me. They pushed his head under and held him there without pulling him up, nor letting him up again. He tried to hold his breath, but he, he had cried out so much that his heart beat too fast for that. His eyes went wide as he breathed in water and his life became heavy and blurry.
through the water from under the surface. Through the water from under the surface, he saw the outlines of the dark ships. resting on the sandy bottom, the sandy floor. In those dim waters, he saw shapes climb out of the holes in the holes of the wreckage. He could not think much as his body shut down. As his body shut down. But he thought he might be imagining it until the glowing red eyes turned his way under the water. It wasn't quite sundown, but when it was full dark, these monsters, the people of True Haven Harbor, these monsters, the people of True Haven Harbor, had missed in the previous night and day. Would emerge. He hoped they all suffered for this. I'll say darkness fell. We'll just leave it at that. <laughs>